<clears throat> Good day, folks. This is Greg Judy at Green Pastures Farm. Today, I want to come back and show you what the cattle did to this ridge. This is the same ridge that Joel and I were on earlier in the week. It was all big blue stem, um, Korean Lespedeza, a little bit of fescue in the bottom. Um, <laughs> it's not a jungle anymore. <laughs> Folks, this was so tall, it was taller than my head. Uh, we hadn't grazed this particular paddock all year. And so it came up with uh, just a ton of big blue stem. You can see what the cattle did to it. Um, well, we had them in here tight enough. They actually ate the, they ate it all. They ate the seed heads. Oh, they didn't eat it all, but they, they took a, lot, a large portion of it. Um, the uh, manure looks pretty good, really. Mmm, man, it smells good. It's got a great smell to it. Um, not offensive at all. It's a lot of stick tight. They kind of trimmed that up right here. But some of the stick tight, they, they literally cleaned it up almost. Um, there's the one they worked on a little bit harder. Some of it, I'm sure, got a little bit mature. But you can see what they went after. They went after the Big Blue. And the Korean Lespedeza. You can see the Korean Lespedeza down here. See, this is uh, third week of July. We won't be back here for at least another 60 days. And so we're going to get another pretty good grazing out of the Korean Lespedeza. And the Big Blue, it'll come back too. So, this is a one hour moves. They had them locked in here. Well, actually, I'm sorry. They were on, uh, I believe it was three hour moves on this one. But they had a, you know, over 300 head on here. And they literally, they literally hammered it. I mean, this, this, these plants are over the top of my head. And now they're, you know, 16 inches tall. The big blue is about 16. So it'll, it'll come cranking back. It's going to be very, very tender. Whatever does come back, because it's all new regrowth. And look at the carbon. The cattle trampled on the ground. I mean, it's, it's hot out here, folks. Um, we're going to hit 98 degrees uh, next week. Today, I think, is 94. It's in the 90s. It is July. It gets in the 90s every year. It's just... Missouri weather. You know, I heard there was this gal on one of the news shows the other morning. I was just laughing. I'm like, you're, you are so insulated from reality. It's unbelievable. She said, oh, there's a global heat wave, a global heat wave, and it's going to hit all the United States, and it's going to be 92 in New York City, and, you know, it's going to be 89 in... You know, Indianapolis, it's like, what? It's freaking summer, lady, wake up. Need some sniffing salt. Of course, she was all freaked out. You know, oh, it's global warming and all this crap. It's like, it's July. It gets hot every July. 92 is an excess, excessive heat wave. Give me a break. Gee, bunch of dang chicken littles. Um... <laughs> I'll, I'll get off of it. I'm sorry. Went on a little bit of a rant there, but it just tickles me that people try to scare everybody. And it's been, you know, Marshall Collier, the old guy that owned this property. Classic example. 2012, worst drought we ever had in Missouri history that I, I've never been a part of. And Marshall was still alive. He was sitting up there in his house. And, of course, Marshall didn't have any air conditioning. He just sitting there with a fan on him. And it was, I don't know, 100 and, 102 that day. We, we went 45 days where it hit 105 heat index. 45 days in a row in 2012. And I'm complaining about it. I'm like, Marshall, it's hot. And the grass isn't growing. Everything's burned up. And he looked at me and grinned. He said, son, he said, you don't know what hot is. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, well, 1936. That's what I'm talking about. I'm like, well, what was so special about 1936? He goes, well, that was the year 
that everything died. There was no grass anywhere. And he said, my cows, he would go out every night and every morning and he took his ax. He didn't have a chainsaw, he took an ax and he'd go out and cut each cow an elm tree. Lots of elms. That's before the Dutch elm disease hit. We still have a few elms, but Dutch elms hammered the elms here across the Midwest. Anyway, he would cut each each cow about a four inch, you know, four inch diameter elm tree. And that's what each cow got for the day. They ate the leaves, they ate the branches, not, you know, not, not big branches, but the little branches, bark, you know. And he said, well, you know, it got him through. He said, it got him through. He said, but you don't, you don't understand. He said, it was so hot that, you know, giant trees died that summer. And he said, so I don't want to hear about you complaining about it being hot and, oh, you know, it's, it's this and this, that. He said, you don't know what hot is. And folks, that was in 1936, way before we had all these automobiles and, you know, what they're saying the human imprint is on the earth. 1936, not everybody was driving a car then. There were still people driving horses. So, I don't know. It's, it's just interesting to see different perspectives. Um, I didn't live in 1936. I always thought it'd be neat to go back to have been uh, and grow up in that decade or whatever, in that time period. And Marshall looked at me and wrinkled his nose up and said, no, you don't, son. He said, I don't want to go back to them good old days. He said, there wasn't nothing good about them. He said, nobody had nothing. There wasn't no way of getting nothing. And you went to bed every night hungry. Felt like your rib was chewing on your backbone. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah. He said, we didn't have anything. He said, we lost our farm. My dad tried for 20 years to pay off an $800 farm. $800. That's what he gave for it, 800 bucks for 60 acres. And he tried for 20 years and never paid it all. Bank came in and took it. Now, folks, that's hard times. He said, you just couldn't get any money. There just wasn't any way to make any money. And the only people that had money were the people that were getting a pension from the government from being in the service, like World War I. There was an old guy around here that put together almost 2,000 acres during that period. He was getting a little bit of a pension, and he took that money and saved it, and he bought up farms, I mean, just one after another, because nobody had any money. I don't know. I just hope we don't ever live to see it <laughs> that bad. But, uh, you know, I think there's nothing wrong with keeping a little money, we call it powder, whatever you want to call it, dry, in case you do have hard times. Um, you know, the, the average household, they said, in the United States, if they had, I think it was a $400 unexpected bill show up, they couldn't pay it. That's right. I think it was around 40% of U.S. households could not find the money if they had a $400 unexpected expense show up. Now that's just, you know, you gotta save. Everybody wants everything and they don't save for tomorrow and that's what happens. So you know, we're 34 trillion in debt and they're saying we're increasing our debt one trillion every hundred days. That's right. The US government, us, the taxpayers, we're going in debt one trillion every hundred days. Hmm. The interest on our debt is equal to the gross domestic product of the whole United States now. So all that money is going to pay interest. We could be building roads, new schools, um, you know, helping people get a start on the land, a whole lot more projects than just giving it away as interest. So, I don't know if we can turn it around. I mean, it doesn't seem like government has a wherewithal. I don't care who you put in there. 
they're better at increasing taxes than they are reducing spending. And until we give everybody in the government a haircut, everybody takes a cut, I don't see how you can turn it around. So printing money works good until nobody wants your dollar. <laughs> That's what happened in Zimbabwe. They went to the quadrillion dollar bill. Quadrillion dollar bill. And it was worth nothing. You couldn't buy a loaf of bread with it. Quadrillion. Hmm. So I'm going to get off of that. But uh, I don't know how I went from Big Blue Stem being chewed on to being more uh, thrifty and taking care of your money. But I'm going to tell you something. I've learned a lot from the, a lot of older people. And one of them, Gordon Hazard. Probably one of the most astute grazers in the world, an old Mississippian. And Gordon wrote a book, <clears throat> Thoughts and Advice from an Old Cattleman. Uh, you can probably find it on Amazon. And Gordon, he said, if you have any more equipment than a wheelbarrow, a small pickup truck, and a hammer and a pair of pliers, you've got too much equipment when it comes to a grazing operation. And Gordon, Gordon would run about 1,800 stalkers by himself. And uh, he always said, you know, on saving money, somebody asked him one day, he said, how do you, how'd you put all this together? Well, you know, when I came back from World War II, he said, I took a little money, the wife and I, we patted it down in a little pile and then we put a little bit more with it. Finally, he said that pile wasn't flat. It started to do that. It started going up. And the more little bit of money we pat together in that little pile, he said, it kept getting bigger. Finally, we had enough money to go buy our first farm. And then they started buying stalkers. And uh, that's where it took off. You know, he had animals working for him on the landscape with all that money that he put together over years that was flat and ended up being a mountain. And, uh, yeah, Gordon was a unique old guy. I'm glad I got to meet him. What an what a awesome human being. Some of the stuff he went through. Oh, then World War II. Oh, my gosh. He wrote a book about it. You talk about a patriot. Man, he's lucky to be... He's lucky he came back. I mean, he was in some really tough, tough battles over there. But, uh, yeah. He, he was... He, he didn't talk about it too much in person, but he did finally write a book about it. I think somebody asked him to. But, anyway... Just be thankful you live in the country you live in. We can do things over here. We don't have somebody stand on our head saying we can't do things. We're not put in prison needlessly yet. Um, <laughs> hopefully it doesn't go that way uh, if you speak your mind. But anyway, uh, it is. It's, it's pretty nice to live in America. I've been in a lot of other countries. I've enjoyed it going to other countries, but I'm always happy to come back to the good old USA. So folks, you all have a good one out there and stay safe and we'll see you next time.